We are, uh, I'd like to introduce Rabban Naidu, he's uh, 25 years in, uh, in Holland now, but uh, he's, a, he's a good South African boy who uh, decided to go and eat cheese and uh, do skating, and has been with uh, Zebia Labs now for Zebia for, for most of that years. time. Yeah. Uh, Ex-APSA colleague of many years ago, but uh, uh, look forward to hearing his view on uh, application release automation and uh, look forward to your questions afterwards. Thanks, Robin. Okay. Okay, <laughs> okay uh, let's get started then. Uh, so today I'm going to talk to you about uh, continu continuous delivery at scale and how you can use the Xavier Labs platform to actually join the dots in your entire DevOps process. So for those of you that don't know uh, Xavier Labs, Xavier Labs has been involved in the DevOps space since the uh, early start, and we only concentrate on DevOps and continuous delivery tooling. Our client base is from all walks of life. We've got people from the in, in, in industries like uh, finance, manufacturing, retail, etc. We've also been uh, regarded as leaders by uh, Gartner and Forrester when it comes to our, uh, our software. So how come do customers come to us? So our customers always come to us because they're looking to scale out their continuous integration, the automation that they've got, and they try to bring it to a wider audience within their organization and try to improve their security and governance at the same time. So when you look at the IT world and how the IT world has evolved over the past 20 years, we've seen that methodologies have changed all the way from waterfall to DevOps. We've got uh, application architectures, looked at NTIA, SOA, microservices, etc. And the way that these applications are packaged today, taken a whole new form with cloud and containers. <laughs> Besides the IT world changing, data is the new oil. And you see that also becoming more and more important in your DevOps process, in your CD process. So with this evolution of changes in the IT world, legacy, cloud, container, as each organization tries to implement CD, they tend to go through the same pattern because with each evolution of the technology, they tend to start at the bottom that concentrates on automation, speed, efficiency. And these tend to start off with small projects at the company trying out the technology, so for cloud container. And then as they get that right, then they start looking towards the enterprise requirements. And the enterprise requirements is like your compliancy, uh, processes, etc. And once they've got that right, then eventually they start looking at, okay, how can I elevate this up to management, to business? And business cares about uh, your visibility, your analytics, and basically your risk, etc. So with the evolution of IT, with the technologies, we tend to see this occurring over and over again. One of the things when you're looking at scaling CD in your organization, it also has to do with the persona, the skill set. Although you have a Java developer, there's different skills involved for each type of person. And the same will go for modern day DevOps practices with your cloud native developer, your DevOps engineers, and your SREs. So the idea is how can we bring in automation in such a fashion that we can appeal to the novice as well as the expert users. And that gives you scale in the organization by appealing to all of those different groups. The Xavier DevOps platform, as I've said, we've been busy with this for over 10 years. And with these recurring patterns, we basically created tooling around that to cater for this changing world without actually worrying about the technology that's behind it. So we start off with uh, Excel Deploy that concentrated on deployment orchestration, solving the deployment orchestration problem in material of technology. And then eventually, when you start to look at CD, it's about how do we uh, use our automated deployments and bring it to a larger audience in an enterprise? And finally, once you've got all of these things up and running, how do you attack that last layer for business and management to get insight into what's actually happening? And that's done with our DevOps intelligence uh, technology. So let's look quickly at the four disconnects to consider when you're scaling your CD in your organization. So, people tend to have these four disconnects, and the first disconnect starts off with CI and CD moving at lightning pace, but it's also happening in the dark. Because you've got so many teams that are trying out DevOps in your organization, you don't actually keep control of it. 
So some teams will be doing DevOps, others won't. Some will be doing CI/CD in a different fashion, using different tooling. And a lot of organizations, when you ask them, how are you doing your CI/CD? They always tell me, we are a modern IT organization. We adopt modern IT practices, cloud and container. That is all handled by my teams. That's fair enough. The other is, I've got Jenkins, and I automate everything with Jenkins. And again, that's fair enough. When you're looking at, at smaller teams that are compartmentalized, that is excellent. In the modern world, the way that teams are adopting DevOps now is, with all cloud and containers, it tends to happen in four steps. You do your GitOps, you check out, change a value for an environment, run it through a templating engine like, like Helm, and then apply it using one of the command line tools. Again, looks very easy because it's all done by my team. When your team starts this process with the tools around it, they tend to start looking at different pipeline technologies. So you've got your Jenkins, your VSTS worker, etc. And they start to organize their deployment orchestration logic around this tooling. And they start to dub it as CD and starting off in that fashion. Again, great when it's one or two teams, excellent. Now when they do that for one environment, they have to do that for the next, the test, UAT, and prod. Again, not a problem when it's small. So you're managing it from your team for those environments. You've got it all as code, scripting, templating, and your pipeline tooling. But the reality is that when you look at deployments, deployments are far more complex than people initially perceive them to be because you've got dependencies, you've got infrastructure, configuration changes per environment, so your configuration variants, you've got to manage your secrets, all of these type of things. And this is the type of logic that people tend to put into pipelines today. So although the tooling executing CF and your template, all the work that comes around it is actually coded in all the pipelines today. When you start to scale this out into a larger part of your organization, because remember that skill set I spoke about, when you have a highly skilled team, they can manage their pipelines all on their own. When you bring it to a larger uh, part in your organization, to more and more teams, you tend to duplicate all of that deployment orchestration logic all over the place. And it's copy, paste, copy, paste all the time. And I think, like, as developers, we always follow software, deliver, uh, software development principles. And the software principles are like, do not repeat yourself. Keep it dry. Separation of concerns. Put, it, put the information where each person needs it. These type of things tend to be thrown out the window when we look at modern day deployments and embedding it in your CD pipelines like Jenkins and VSTS. So one of the things is how do we eliminate that concept of duplicating deployment orchestration logic in each and every place in your organization? How can you keep control of that? With Excel Deploy, we cater for this by being model driven. So we do model driven deployment orchestration independent of technology. Because deployment orchestration, stopping, starting, waiting, restart, dependencies, they're the same, immaterial of technology. So how can we model those type of concepts out in a reusable fashion? And with our Excel deploy technology, when you're scaling it out in the organization, all the things that your teams have to do is concentrate on things like what? What do I need to deploy? Do I need to deploy a Java application? Do I need to deploy a container? And that's it. They shouldn't have to care about where am I deploying it? Am I deploying it to test, prod? Doesn't care. Is it on the cloud? Is it on-prem? They shouldn't care about the where part. When should it happen? You shouldn't care about when. Should this happen in parallel, sequential? Again, those things that are things that your deployment tool should actually take care of for you. And finally, the how. Because to eliminate repetitiveness, the, the your uh, copy-paste uh, habits, the how should actually be done by your deployment orchestration tool. So in a simple demo, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use uh, Red Hat OpenShift to show you a cloud uh, uh, a container platform incorporated with legacy type of deployment. So JBoss running on a VM and a traditional SQL Postgres that's also running on a JVM somewhere. 
So this follows the microservices pattern, and it's got about six services that all need to be orchestrated together in order to actually install the application on this hybrid type of environment. So if we go and have a look at the tool to actually see how we do this, um, I'll switch over. So all of this is live demo, so I hope nothing's going to get messed up. But to start off with, centralizing deployment orchestration, immaterial of technology. It starts off with these questions of the what. What needs to happen first of all? So as a SRE or a DevOps engineer, I have environments and infrastructure that I have to deploy to. I could be deploying to OpenShift cluster on my uh, local uh, environment, or it could, could be in Azure or AWS. So the way that we do that is we capture infrastructure in our infrastructure part of our model. And the model is fairly simple in the sense that we give you a catalog of types of technologies that you can deploy to. From this catalog, we tell you things like, OK, I'm going to deploy to the cloud. I'm going to deploy to WebSphere, whatever the case is. Really doesn't matter. You pick the type. And once you've got the type, you tell the system basic information about connectivity. So for instance, I've got an OpenShift cluster. Where does it live? What are my uh, tokens, et cetera? And the system registers this, the what. What should happen here? The second aspect of, of this is grouping these items together, because you're going to have many different types of uh, environments, targets, grouping them into logical units so that, again, you can create this concept of self-service deployments, etc., in a larger organization. Apply security over this so that not everybody can see every single environment. Now, an environment in our system is made up of a simple definition matching up all the containers that go in here. So for our application, we've got the OpenShift uh, cluster in here and also a place to run your smoke tests, and basically where JBoss lives. Once we've got this environment definition, the next part is, how can I actually make the what independent of this environment? So I don't want to rebuild. I don't want to run Helm every single time I need to deploy to a different environment. So with that, we've got a concept of dictionaries. So this helps us with our configuration, helps you with configuration variance between each environment. And configuration is set up in simple uh, key value pairs. We've also got other types of dictionaries that apply different techniques. But it's simply put key value pairs that are specific to this environment. So when you're scaling out to another environment, for instance, you don't have to care about the composition. You can just copy the dictionary, make changes to the dictionary, and then manage the configuration. Other types of things that you can do when it works in one environment and is failing in another environment, because you've got your deployment orchestration and your configuration in one place, now, for instance, we can, we can start comparing different items. So different items, comparing it to my QA, prod, etc. So it, again, helps you with understanding your configuration variance across your different uh, environments. Now, once we've sorted out configuration, the final part is, how do we scale this out to our developers, to the rest of our teams? And that, con that concept is actually built into applications. Applications are made up of many, many different types of applications. These are actually deployment units, if you'd like. A deployment unit has got a version. It can have many different versions. As it's coming out of your CI process, you're capturing that unit so that you can trace it and have uh, complete control of which versions go to production. Inside a version resides your components that you want to deploy. Now, the components that you deploy, immaterial of technology, the system offers you a catalog of all the different types of technologies. This is a plugin-based uh, system. So all the different types of plugins that you have relative to your technologies, you'll find them in the UI as first-class citizens. And if you're doing legacy stuff like uh, WebSphere, all the stuff you can do in WebSphere, more modern day stuff like AWS, if you have to pick an EC2 instance, you pick the type. Once you've got the type registered, then what the system does for you, it basically tells you all the different types of items that you can actually configure on that particular type. So here, for instance, we've got things that the developer knows. So a developer will have his JNDI. That's definite. It's in his code. Other things that he doesn't know that are variant 
in each environment that a different persona is going to bring uh, into the deployment, we use placeholders to replace them. And this is where the dictionary, the configuration management, gets married into the in independent uh, application component. So once we've got all of these items, the other aspect is the where part. So let's do a deployment of the main application. We're going to take uh, main application. Got a deployment pipeline for this, so I'm going to take the first version. I just manage the high-level component. And what the system does, it analyzes the package, it analyzes the dependencies, pulls in all the dependencies that are not installed of the incorrect version on the target environment, and it maps it to the correct containers in here. So this intelligence is done for different versions and uh, different types of topology in your environment. So tomorrow, if you want to scale it up, we drop another container, infrastructure container in the environment, and the system will automatically take care of that where portion for you. When it does this mapping, one of the things that it does is replaces the values. And when it replaces the values, you can see, for instance, those placeholders are replaced with dictionary values. So this helps you with managing configuration in one place. Now, the next part is what I told you about people copy deployment logic all over the place. Now, the Excel deploy system is different than workflow type of tools and script-based tools because we generate that workflow for you. So if we look onto the preview up here, we're going to see that the system analyzes infra, the application that's been deployed, and it figures out what are all the steps involved in you. So here it generated the plan and it figured out I've got some database changes, so it'll run the database changes, integrating with different types of tooling, DB Maestro, uh, Datical, Liquibase, etc. Once you've got your database up and running, you can see that it's figured out that it's got some open shift stuff to do, and it's generated all of the steps that are needed. So one of the things you'll notice in modern day cloud technology, everything is asynchronous, so it becomes a real burden in your pipelines to code up the wait steps, for instance. It becomes a real burden to do dependency management because lots of people in their container technologies, they tend to use init containers, for instance, in a uh, Kubernetes. That's just to get order in the deployments. Now with Excel Deploy, you don't have to bother about that. And the same pattern, same deployment orchestration logic is applied to every single application of that type, component of that type coming through the system. So this is based on the rules-based system. And to understand what the system is doing, you can drill down and the system will tell you which rule it used, what's the type of scripts that it's going to generate to actually perform the deployment. Now, once we've got this thing generated, we'll go off and perform the deployment. So deploy. And Excel Deploy uses agentless technology or REST services for the cloud, et cetera, to communicate with the infrastructure and actually perform what needs to be done. In here, for instance, you see the logs that are coming back from executing of the command. And you've also got a chance to interact with, uh, with the system. The system has just flagged that there's an error going to occur. And if we drill further down to find the error, we notice that our Kubernetes deployment is going pretty fine. It's waiting for the services to come up. But we've got a problem with our JBoss deployment. Because our JBoss deployment says, OK, it can't find a particular driver. Because you read the logs, try to figure it out. So the system doesn't just stop dead in its track, and you have to start all over again to do the, the deployments. It knows exactly where it is, and it aids you in solving the problem. So let's try and solve this problem really quickly, and I'll deploy the, the database driver. And let's deploy this. All right, so now it goes off. We've got a different package. Same type of concept, type, parameters for it, and the system figures out where and how. And now, for instance, I can try the, the thing ex exactly from where I left off. So now the system will go off, and it'll start. It left my Kubernetes in place. I also had the capability at that moment in time to do a rollback. But in this case, I, will, I managed to figure out what the problem was and try to push through the deployment. So this helps you with when you're looking at scaling and moving into production, etc. your downtimes for your uh, deployments. This reduces all of that because you're troubleshooting 
is done from the deployment orchestrator. The system has run, so we actually know that it's successful because we've actually run some smoke tests, sanity checks, that everybody does after they've done a deployment. Let me go check if each service is up, etc. So now we've actually deployed our application, and our application, if we copy-paste that quickly. So we've actually deployed an application that's a hybrid application used with legacy old type of traditional technologies mixed in with cloud and containers. So this is the concept of how you centralize deployment orchestration, everybody uses it, and you have consistency and repeatability in the way that you actually perform your deployments. Once you've performed your deployments, the first time, excellent. Next time is going to be about updates. So how does the system react to updates? So with, with updates, it's a simple click on the button, say deploy. System is going to analyze what's been done. In the past, it knows that we've pushed out the application. It knows the new version it is. And it's figured out that the only thing that has changed is the web component. Ah, come on, web component. So it's generated a completely different plan for you. Now, this is the power of a deployment orchestration engine where, based on rules, it understands how to handle different situations. You're not repeating yourself in every single place in your CD pipeline. All right, so we can run this also quickly to, to check that out. And again, with an update. Okay, I'm not going to wait for this, but you get the idea up here. So simple deployments. When you actually need to perform um, rollbacks again, you can use the rollback button to actually perform that for you. So moving back, that's the deployment orchestration and how you can solve a lot of your problems by using a deployment orchestration engine. So we didn't copy anything. We just did definitions, and the system took care of how, where, and when. When we continue with the look at the disconnects, once you've got deployment orchestration sorted out, you look at your pipelines. And in an organization, in an enterprise, you've got many, many different disciplines. Development, your IT organization, your business, and everybody tends to use different tools. And all the different types of tools that you're using, you're not going to throw out of your organization because I am a modern IT cloud type of team. You still need all of these processes and things in place because they are just good practices. And all the different types of tooling that you get, you're not going to get people to leave those tools to come into the command line, for instance, to go into Jenkins to do all of their stuff. So you need a way to actually address all of these different types of personas, all of their different needs and bring them into the CD pipeline. Second, uh, third one is the lack of uh, security and operations, actually, because when you're looking at your teams again, you've got many developers, few security specialists, and few operation specialists that know how to actually run a Kubernetes cluster, know how to add new nodes, etc. So you're always going to have this different number of people in there. Besides the different number of people, you're also going to have different skill sets. So when you're doing your CD, how can you apply policies, security techniques, etc., that appeal to the novice as well as the expert in your development teams, in your DevOps teams? So getting security as a first-class citizen in this process and make it repeatable. The last disconnect, if you think about it, is about the business process itself. Everything starts off with a feature, a feature moves on to the development team, and then as you move further down the release process, you start to get people that are less technically involved. But you still need to bring them into this process. So you need to connect those different disciplines. As you move to production, your ITSM practices, you also need to bring them in. It doesn't mean to say with DevOps that ITSM is all of a sudden a bad thing. It's there for stability and change. And again, when you're looking at enterprises, it's also about auditing. How do you manage all of those audits, et cetera? Sorry, I'm just keeping a look at the time every single time. Okay, cool. So, to tackle that type of uh, problem, the pipeline problem, where you have to look at all of these different disciplines, and each discipline is going to need a different type of 
pipeline to help them automate their workload. You can't expect your ITSM person, if he needs to do some automation, to go all the way back down into code, into Jenkins, to do all of that stuff. That's kind of yeah, counterproductive for him, and that's why he'll never ever join your CD process. So with uh, Xavier Labs uh, Excel release, we try to, again, to model out a process for a certain persona and automate that through reusability. So we don't copy, we model again. So if we go into uh, demo mode again, let's go into this concept of Excel release and what it does. So when you're modeling, it all starts off with the concept of a template, because a template is going to be your base, and you're going to reuse it all of the time. So again, you don't repeat yourselves when you're integrating it with your CI, your CD process. A template comprises of a few aspects. It is a simple uh, task-orientated board. If guys that are familiar with Kanban, this is like the Kanban view. You set up phases, columns that are in here. And within each phase, you can have many different tasks to execute. Now, tasks depend on the type of persona you're creating the pipeline for. What do they need to automate? And you find during the left-hand side, you have your plan and your dev. These are more uh, tool related to developers. So your uh, Jira, your Jenkins, your OpenShift, etc. So you can map out all of these different items that need to take place. They can start off as manual steps, or you can actually later on change them into more specific automated steps. Just like with Excel Deploy, you get a catalog to choose from, and you can also add to this catalog of the type of thing that you want to do. So for instance, if you want to do something like Delphix, so Delphix is about uh, data virtualization. If we need to spin up a database before we start our tests, it's a matter of simply Finding the task that we want to perform, provision database, right? When you drill down into the task, the task gives you basic information about what are the inputs needed to actually complete this task, and it's going to tell you the outputs that come out of this process. So this is consumable from anyone. If you know how those technologies work, you don't have to know the underlying APIs to make it work. So simple input output, and you string your tasks together. And this is how we build up a complete pipeline, a complete plan. Now, as you move towards production, you'll notice things that become more ITSM related. You can incorporate your ITSM process in there, and in between you can also do like your static code analysis, your dynamic code analysis, etc. So if, so if we see this executing, because in reality, because of reusability, nobody creates one big pipeline as you've seen there. They break it up and try to, to, go, to get to the needs of the persona that's going to use that particular uh, technology, or sorry, that particular pipeline. So in this example, we can take that same cool store app that we just deployed. Oh, sorry, I should have showed you one more thing. Okay, I'll come back to it later. But one of the things you'll notice in these pipelines that I'm going to show you, they are devoid of low-level deployment orchestration logic. Because from an Excel uh, deploy perspective, uh, sorry, from an Excel release perspective, you are generating your deployment orchestration. So the only thing that you need to incorporate into your pipeline is a high-level abstraction. For instance, I need to deploy this version onto this environment. End of story when you're looking at it from a pipeline perspective. Remember your configuration variance, the generation of your, uh, to your speci specific infrastructure is all done by the automated generated deployment engine. So this simplifies your, uh, your pipelines immensely and makes them highly reusable. Because now using placeholders and variables, we can change the name for instance versions of things that we need to, to push out so that the same team or different teams can use the same pipeline to push through the technology. So let's get back to our business release. So if you take, if you take the uh, 
product owner, as an example. So Trey does a lot of his work in Jira. So he's used to this type of world, where he sees all of these items and things happen with them, but he only can track them from what's inside Jira. The work that he actually has to do with each one of these things, he has to monitor like, okay, is my feature complete is only when all my user stories are complete? How do I close out my user story? It's a little more work than actually a developer saying done on an issue because there's lots of works that come after that. So for instance, maybe checking your compliance, you're doing acceptance, testing, whatever the case is. And then only when it's passed through that part, then is the feature actually complete or the user story. Another important part is traceability, auditability. So you start to create, you need to create a chain of custody. How can I track a feature from the time it was created all the way that it went to production? How do I manage that? So these are the type of pipelines that can do a lot of bookkeeping for you in order to keep all of these different personas and all the work that they do in sync. And that's how come you also get a lot of uh, separation between the ITSM organization and the DevOps organization because there is no automation to do that bookkeeping for them. And that's why you forget to do that. So if you've got your plan and your user stories, etc., and once all of those stories are finished, what do I do to close off this release? Releasing to your customer, creating release notes, all of these type of things. So let's have a look at these templates. Remember, we've just got three templates that we're going to try to use. Uh, cool store. So we've got this cool store release that's sitting in uh, Jira. We're going to use our templates, our pipeline templates, our delivery templates, if you'd like, to actually go out to Jira, look at Jira, figure out what are the features attached to this release, figure out all the stories that are attached to those uh, epics, and try to figure out things from there. So now the system has went off looked at Jira, and it's actually found seven items. We can look at these things from a Kanban board, but we can also look at it from a Excel spreadsheet form. Helps you better with filtering, etc. So these are the stories that it found. But what will really help us is actually if we can get a better visualization of this, because this is all about connected pipelines, not about single pipelines. So if we look at our connected pipelines, we can switch over to our relationships view. Uh, hide templates. Ah, I hate this resolution. Okay, okay, I'll fix this up in a bit. But let's print that out. Okay. <laughs> so in any case, up here you get a little visualization about the stories that are active and basically the stories that are active. If we drill down into each one of these items, we have the capability to look at the pipeline that's actually tracking these items. You can see that it's done the bookkeeping for us, for instance, and it's waiting for a CD pipeline to actually deliver one of these components that are going through. If you look from a traceability perspective, as I said, it's about linking all of those different tools together. So people that are used to the tools that they uh, use, they don't have to leave it to come into this new tool to actually see it. So from here, we've created traceability by, with a simple click, we can go out into Jira, and we can see the story that's been tracked by this. Other types of information, because we updated the ticket, we've updated the ticket with information that says, okay, I've got a business release that's running. And with this, we can drill back down into the pipeline to see which one is actually managing this pipeline. So what you're actually doing up here is you're creating a natural audit trail for yourself as you move along your delivery pipeline. So let's close that one off. Okay. So that's the, the look at a pipeline and a CD pipeline, if you'd like, delivery pipeline for the product owner. He's tracking his, his items out there. Let's look at it from a developer perspective. And a developer perspective has got two concerns. First concern that he has is his code. And the code that he has, he's more interested in Git. Am I using Git flow, feature branch merging, and all of these type of uh, techniques? And he wants automation to actually take care of what happens on a feature branch merge. So find out stories, 
execute his own custom pipeline, because what I'm showing you here is the UI part of it. But everything can be driven as code, simple YAML, et cetera. So this helps you integrate the bookkeeping aspect of software delivery with the technical aspect of it. The second concern that a person has or a developer has is, what techniques do I use? What patterns do I use to actually perform my deployments to production? So do I need to start performing something like blue-green deployments or canary deployments? If we pick up a canary deployment type of template, it has to do with disabling half of uh, the traffic or taking out servers, waiting for them to drain, putting the new version in there, and then enabling it again. And this pattern, I'm using AWS here as this pattern to, to do uh, the deployment as a canary, but the pattern stays the same. If you get smart and you start to use things like Snap, you can just replace it with Snap tasks in here. Process stays the same, pattern stays the same, immaterial of the technology that's, under, that's underlying. Look at continuous delivery. Let's look at a continuous delivery pattern of this thing. Because remember, you can also have patterns like release trains, et cetera, all modeled out here, and the system will take care of moving them across as they become available. So when you look at things like from a developer that's doing continuous delivery, his thought pattern is first on the build process. This example shows uh, uh, things like uh, open shift, using an open shift task to actually do a build for you. Once you've done, you do things like uh, security scans and perform your deployment once again. Remember the deployment, we've simplified it because it's just a package and a version and no low level uh, understanding. As you move closer towards production, you start to see things like uh, ITSM coming in. And at this point in time, remember all the tools I showed you, if you're using the right tools for the right job, life becomes a lot easier. Because, for instance, if you use something like a uh, Sonotype uh, lifecycle and you want to enforce it before production, for instance, make sure that there's no vulnerability scans after the fact, after development, you can run a scan again. And with this concept of shift left, this is like a more op-centric use of, uh, of the scanning technology life cycle. But if you need to move it left, it's literally moving left. So you just drag and drop, and you move it a bit more to the left. Put it in the right place in your process, and things will start to happen again. So that makes life a lot easier for yourself. So if we look at this pipeline, and how does it compare to what the developer is going to do? How is he going to interact with it? The developer is going to simply stay in his source code. So this is GitHub. I've got a pull request that's open. And we're going to merge a pull request. And now that whole workflow of how to push things out for a code commit, for a uh, feature branch uh, request merge, etc., is taken out of the hands of the developer. He doesn't have to bother about it. Because he's got high re highly reusable templates in the form of uh, the Excel release templates. And in here, we started off a release based on what just uh, occurred. A git commit occurred. We drilled down into it. And what we see now is that all the different tasks that I've just shown you in the template, we basically run through them. And the things that we've done is we've done some uh, builds, deployments, etc. did some uh, uh, some testing, and now we actually mimic the way that we're going to actually move to production. And moving to production, we've got two open standing tasks out here. One is, as I said, this concept of using lifecycle before you deploy to uh, production. We're running a scan again, using the new definitions, any new policies that were introduced. And what we're going to do is simulate a manual process of approval. And the manual process of approval is I need a security officer open up a change. He needs to do an approval of that. So here we've basically done our scan. In our scan, if we open it out, we got a lot more information about what happened, etc. We also got timing. How long did it take? It took us 29 seconds. Excellent. So now we've got a reference for the next time we do a, uh, a deployment. But in any case, we're waiting for the change management to actually uh, oh, sorry. We're actually waiting for change management to do an approval. We don't want him to leave his tool. We actually want him to be incorporated in the process with 
the lowest possible uh, effort. So if we go out here, go out here. Right, so let's find our change request. I'm going to go off into service now. It can be any change management tool. Remember, technology independent of the process. And here we can see, okay, what we've got to do. So we've got a, there's a request for an approval. And normally, it's a pain to actually give context <laughs> to a person. But with doing this in an automated fashion and bringing your ITSM guys into your DevOps process, now we've got lots of information, rich context information that we can send out. So instead of making my decision of, oh, I've got to do security checks for this particular change, what is it? Now with a simple click on the button, I can go off into this uh, Excel release, look at the pipeline that's actually delivering it, and start to utilize our dashboard capability. So with the dashboard capability, let's come in. Yay. So now, with different dashboard tiles that are attached to the pipeline, we can actually look at things like uh, resource usage, who's assigned to what, when are they in the process, what still needs to happen, who's still to come in the process. We can also do looking at our security, because that was the main aim here. And we can see that we've got some licensing violations, but we've also got some critical and medium violations. Now, this type of information, again, is all based from your, uh, your Nexus lifecycle, for instance. So Excel release doesn't store the information. It highlights the information in your pipeline, but the single source of truth still remains the tool that you use. So here, for instance, to look at our security issues that are in the release stage, with a simple click on the button. Oh, return to admin. What was the password again? <coughs> and then one, two, three, four. Right, so with a simple click on the button now, as a change manager, I managed to see the pipeline, look at its context, click through again, go to the single source of truth, your Nexus lifecycle, look at the policies, look at what's been violated, drill down, get a richer experience of that uh, information within the DevOps pipeline, and after this he can make his decision of, okay, you know what, I think it's fine. So what he's gonna do is, Go in and close here. And he's going to say, OK, you know what? I've seen the security risk. I know it. I'm going to take responsibility for it. And I'm going to approve it. So six months, seven months down the line, when your auditors come in and your auditors ask you, why did you put a application that had vulnerabilities in it into production, you've got complete traceability of this, uh, of this item. And everybody, 4i principle, has approved it. And if you go back into Excel release, we see that after a little while, our process has moved on. So it's moved on, close the change ticket, and that's the end of actually delivering your software to production. From a product owner perspective, if anybody ever asks him, hey, you guys have been working on Cool, cool 7, where is that feature? How, how was it this thing? I see things are done in Jira, but where is it in the process? So let's go back and try to find our business release. Drill back down here, and we'll go to that relationships. All right, so uh, 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 I hate my mouse. OK. Come on. <laughs> Why is it doing this to me? Reset. Okay, yeah, okay, this is good, good enough for now. Okay, so in here, basically, if it was a better view, <laughs> you see that it's the delivery pipeline, the technical release is linked back up to your business process. We can drill down again from an audit perspective, look exactly at what stories we found for that particular commit, and we've propagated it to all the different places. Other important things that you can get out of this process is if I've got a feature that's complete, I can actually start to look at things like richer type of uh, documentation I publish. For instance, in this particular example, after the feature was completed, we actually published a knowledge-based article into, ServiceNow, into the ServiceNow portal. And because you've got the richest information during your pipeline execution, now you can start to do things like, 
I've released it, I've got the Excel pipeline that delivered it, I've got the feature that delivered it, and all the stories that were attached to it. So that's basically how you do these type of things and track it from a enterprise scale doing delivery. Right, so that's going back to the slides. So now that we've shown you software delivery pipelines for many different people, not only the techies, the benefits that you get from the Xavier Labs platform is that it brings all of these different disciplines all together using a model-based approach so you do not repeat yourself and this is the key to scaling in an organization when you use the Excel DevOps platform. So that's it and I open the floor up for any questions. Any questions? I think this one. Uh, hi. Uh, so yeah, it looks like magic, but uh, how many large enterprises are using your platform currently? I'd just be interested in having a view. Well, uh, let's see. Avian Ambro <laughs> is one for this thing. A large, large bank. We've got uh, Rabobank in the States. Let's give you like Amex, for instance. Amex runs all of the stuff. Uh, e Net Netbank, uh, EA Sports. Do you do you play FIFA? Because FIFA is completely rolled off with Excel release and Excel deploy with zero downtime. So whenever you play in the game, remember Excel releases. <laughs> it is actually doing that for you. And you've got guys like uh, Apple. NASA. So many different walks of life that actually utilize the, the product. Great, thanks. Okay. Is it possible for you to give us a high-level view of your licensing model? High-level view of license model? I always look to Barry for that. I'm the tech guy. I don't sell stuff. <laughs> the net net is that it works off a user base license. So um, annual subscription, um, like most of the stuff we do these days. Uh, works with a user base license, so you'll define the number of users that will utilize the release and the, and, 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 uh, and the deployed product. Um, but we can delve into it uh, a little bit more if you want um, at a later stage. But it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's based on a per user base license. Right. I maybe want to just ask a question because I'm trying to figure out what is the difference between a pipeline and a value stream? Because I noticed that there was a selection on the, uh, uh, the tool set of gives you that kind of option. So what is the, what's the difference between the two? Value stream and a pipeline is the same type of thing because your value stream, you try to automate your value stream. So you can use the tool to actually do that for you. So for, in, <coughs> for instance, if I go back to an example up here, I didn't show you dashboards and stuff like that because of time. problems with my resolution, but okay, if it doesn't matter, I'll try and explain. So value stream mapping is what is the value that you're trying to deliver? And today people can capture that in different types of uh, tooling, but they're not automated. Up here, because we've got pipelines for everyone, you can actually automate that value stream and also try to include it to drive other types of uh, processes in the pipeline, technical or non-technical. Because it's coming out from one place, you start to create this end-to-end -end traceability. And that's actually going to show you a value stream. Other types of things that you're doing is, even if everything in the system is manual, you start tracking times, for instance. And you can start to identify bottlenecks and try to solve those type of problems. If you notice in, um, in your system, if uh, the, the longest running task, for instance, you need to focus on that. So that helps you to actually get concrete information about, dear business, to get more value out of this, I need more budget to tackle my non-automated performance testing, something like that. So that's the, the mix that you can get. Again, story is pipelines for everyone. And I think also uh, on the task level, you can set up SLAs. So if a task runs over a certain time, we can escalate that. 
um, building the dashboards, um, if you're using the stick, the wall of shame, uh, if you're using the carrot, the merit wall, rock star wall, whatever, you case, uh, whatever the cases you want to call it, um, are all possibilities to, to actually visualize the, uh, uh, the value of what the various Agile teams bring to the party. And exactly, that's the release value stream mapping. It's the one that we just ran. We notice how this thing, it tracks how many failures, etc. And based on that information as well, it's, it has the capability of spitting out risk for you. So it'll get, allocate risk scores to certain things to get your focus on this. Any more questions? One more down there. Thank you. I just wanted to query one thing. So I see that in the workflows that you've got going on here, you can put in SLAs for um, actions to be taken by certain individuals. Of particular interest is that of the security officer, where you may have vulnerabilities that uh, may not be resolvable at the point in time where the review takes place. And we have a lot of cases in business, due to whatever reasons uh, there may be, where some of those tasks may require tracking uh, over a, a period of time, perhaps uh, conditional approvals, and those kinds of things, where once an action has been uh, marked off as approved, uh, we still need to kind of revisit that uh, task on a fairly regular basis. How would we deal with that kind of condition okay. uh, using Excel? So when you're in, uh, interacting with tasks, you have the capability of, uh, let's look at the task directly. When you drill down into a task, you have the ability to complete it, skip it, or fail it. Right? Once you've skipped, failed, or whatever, you've also got in the task a concept of a precondition. So for instance, I could say that if I've skipped this task, or I've marked it as uh, it's okay for now kind of thing. Then in the next part in my pipeline, I would have a separate section that says, what do I need to do with this? Because you mentioned I need to track it from now onward. So how do you track it now? What's your single source of truth? Is your JIRA the single source of truth or is your service now? Do you open an incident or do you open up a ticket? So then you'll create that ticket and then you'll start tracking it in that way. So from the pipeline perspective, you've always got that capability of putting in any of the logic that you need to handle that situation. And other types of things to track these uh, type of tasks, uh -huh. you can also with the reporting system. If you tag it, etc., the one that I just showed you with the um, uh, value stream, you can start tracking how is that task behaving over multiple releases. And using, uh, we've also got a um, uh, prediction, uh, risk prediction uh, engine that's attached to this that also analyzes those things and it tells you that, hey, you don't have to track it anymore. It'll tell you over time that we see that in this, this particular task has been skipped every time or it's failing at a high rate. You may need to look at it and it gives you a recommendation. So those are all possibilities within the system. Okay? Okay, cool. Thanks. Cool. Guys, in the interest of time, I am going to close out questions for Ravan. He's going to be around, so corner him if you want over one of the breaks.